Welcome to this Investor Bootcamp episode on the Australian Investors Podcast. In this episode, I'm talking about competitive advantages or moats and why they are important to understand if you choose to invest in a long-term manner. In this episode, I'm going to talk to you about what is a competitive advantage or moat, how they're measured, I'm going to profile some industries and some companies that exhibit wide or narrow moats, and also some industry or one industry in particular that is a source of value destruction. This episode is also going to include the names of some books or some videos, so please check out the show notes and refer to the Investor Bootcamp training manual, which is available if you click inside your podcast player and you access the Google Doc. A moat is a ring of water that keeps enemies out of castles. In investing, a moat is the thing that keeps competitors away from your core business or franchise. Aside from the usual suspects like Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, or Charlie Munger, the book called Value Investing by Bruce Greenwald illustrates the power of moats slash competitive advantages and franchises. Greenwald showcases why companies often destroy shareholder value when they invest outside of their moat. It's like in those medieval movies when the king sends his soldiers outside of the castle to fight, and the only thing that you can think of is, what in the flame and heck is he doing? Keep those soldiers inside the walls and protect your soldiers from the attack. The pioneer in understanding competitive advantages, or moats, which, by the way, I'll use interchangeably as we continue through this podcast, is Michael Porter, the author of Competitive Strategy, a book published in 1980, and Competitive Advantage, another book published in 1985. He's also one of the authors of Harvard Business Review's 10 must-reads on strategy. As we go through the podcast, I'll introduce an important technique for evaluating a company's moat, as demonstrated by Porter. To summarize, a moat is a feature of a business that enables it to generate excess returns on capital for a sustained period. Because under the rules of capitalism, Usually, a competitor would enter the market when a company is earning those excess returns and eat away at them. This is why Charlie Munger introduced Warren Buffett and many of us to the idea of a durable competitive advantage or a wonderful business. But enough of the legacy and theory. Let's jump into some examples. Morningstar's five moats. Morningstar is the global investment research house. They have an analyst team around the world who spend their days doing two things. Number one, valuing companies, and number two, assigning moat ratings. They assign narrow for a narrow moat, a wide moat for the best kind of moat, and a no moat rating for the companies that they believe cannot generate excess returns over their cost of capital. Their team have identified five types of competitive advantages or moats. We'll go through them one by one, and I'll use some examples as we go through. Number one, network effects. A network effect occurs when something like Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, even payments networks, Amazon, or even something like Vanguard becomes more valuable as more people use it. To identify these companies, what you're looking for are rapidly rising user or customer numbers with a lower per unit marketing or sales expense, a lower customer acquisition cost. For example, If you spend $100 to find one customer for your business, that's a customer acquisition cost of $100. But if the next two customers cost $50 in total, that is three customers for a total spend of $150, your per unit cost is now $50, so it's halved. If the next four customers cost just $20 to acquire, that's a per unit cost of around $25, so you've halved it again but you've got more customers. So in total, you've spent $170 for seven customers. This relationship between cost and user numbers or customer numbers may be a strong signal to you that the company you're researching is growing faster with less effort. This is the essence of a network effect. Number two, intangible assets. Apple, Commonwealth Bank, Twitter, Intangible assets often include brands, patents, copyright, and just about anything else that makes a product or service special. You're probably thinking of Disney's cartoons, Lego, or even McDonald's. David Gardner, the co-founder of The Motley Fool, and a tremendous investor, has something called a snap test. 
Click your fingers and imagine that a company's products or services just disappear. Would you notice? While not a perfect corollary, it's a neat way to think of brands and products as being valuable. Interestingly, I believe investors often think that intangible assets are strictly limited to brands or patents. I've found that simple things like customer email lists or legacy partnerships can often yield high returns on capital. The idea is that whatever asset the company might own will lower the search cost or effort of a purchaser, may enable the owner to increase the price for the product, and is hard to quantify on a balance sheet. That is the essence of an intangible asset. For example, if you go to the supermarket and you want baked beans, you see Heinz. That's good enough, is probably what you'll say, even if there is an option that's 50 cents cheaper right next to it. So why do you think of Heinz that way? Well, it's because you know the Heinz brand. So you don't need to keep searching for alternatives. So the search cost is lower, and you're happy to pay for the taste or the flavor. This is what enables Heinz to earn a higher return on capital for each can of baked beans. Number three, cost advantage. The way I interpret a cost advantage is it's on the supply side and is often part of their secret source for companies such as Coles, Woolworths, Aldi, Walmart, etc. Along with efficient scale, which I'll get to in a minute, cost advantage is also a source of moat for mining companies. You can think of BHP or Rio Tinto. Some investors believe that the only true durable advantage of a company is a supply side advantage and that the key way to measure it is via replication. How long would it take and how much money would you need to replicate a company's supply side advantage? For example, Fortescue Metals Group or FMG has its own mine sites, trains, rail networks, ports and ships for its iron ore. So it's no wonder it's one of the lowest cost iron ore miners in the world And now, after many years of a struggle, earns outlandishly high returns on invested capital when iron ore prices are at reasonable levels. Number four, switching costs. These are costs that make it hard or near impossible for customers to give up a service or product. This power means that the company can raise prices. A subscription to Xero's or Intuit's QuickBooks accounting software would be extremely difficult for accountants to cancel. And Microsoft Office Bundle is a mainstay in workplaces for this exact reason, even though I'm reading this from a Google document. These are examples of products with high switching costs. Number five, efficient scale. Some businesses or industries carve out a moat by simply being the biggest in that sector or vertical. These are often but not always niche markets that can be very technical. For example, on this very podcast, Stephen Arnold from Aorus Investment Management talked about the glues and adhesives market for nappies. Then we have aeroplane parts, where there are high-value, low-cost inputs supplied by oftentimes one unique supplier. The result is that oftentimes in these markets, it's not worth a new company entering. For example, APA is Australia's largest gas pipeline operator. For a new company to compete against APA, it would cost billions and billions of dollars to build the same infrastructure. But the rewards for building all of that infrastructure are probably not worth it since most of the demand is catered for by APA. This means APA's top spot is really challenged. There are many different types of competitive advantage. These are just some of the ways to bucket them, as Morningstar have done, in your portfolio or during your research process. Fantastic modes and where to find them. Over the past 20 years, the investment industry has taken huge leaps forward. We've gone from $100 minimum brokerage to $0. Parcel sizes have come down from thousands to $1. And investors finally have access to investor transcripts and calls and financial reporting just like any analyst. Yet for all of these improvements in information and analytics, many investors find themselves spending too much time on the wrong things and not nearly enough time on the things that matter. If you're trying to find competitively advantaged businesses, it would make sense to fish where the fish are and try to narrow your field of search to the sectors or types of companies where these beasts can be found. Morningstar analysts did 
a thorough review of the different sectors and applied their ratings of moats by sector. Some of the sectors with the widest moats include consumer defensive, healthcare, and energy. Next might be industrials and technology. The industry with the most narrow moats, that's that kind of intermediate moat rating, was the utility sector. And here, this is a good case study. Why would this industry, being utilities, have a narrow moat rating? Now, I think it's because many of the companies in that industry can earn consistent returns. Think of power grids. However, what tends to happen is these companies tend to be heavily regulated, so they cannot raise prices infinitely. And if we think about it, wide moats are the best type of moats because you're able to retain customers and increase prices at the same time. However, if you're constrained in how you can raise prices, you might find that you cannot earn excessive returns on invested capital. I've already alluded to it, but the way most of us measure, and when I say us, I mean as an industry of analysts, the way most of us measure a company's moat quantitatively is to use the company's return on invested capital, or ROIC, and compare it against the cost of sourcing that capital, most often known as the Weighted Average Cost of Capital, or WAC. To me, it is not surprising that sectors like real estate have few companies with durable advantages. If you think about it, real estate development companies use huge amounts of debt and leverage to earn returns of 10 to 20%. So it only takes a few of them to fail and or cost to overrun the budget and the returns sink. Then there are tenders for large scale projects that are also often competitive processes or competitive tenders, allowing the customer to choose the company based on prices. So there is competition based purely on price. Finally, I want to talk to you about an industry and a subsector of an industry that is arguably demonstrating the worst return in human history, airlines. As I wrote in our Value Investor program, there was a fantastic study done on the airline industry overall, and it compared the return on invested capital against the weighted average cost of capital to show which companies within the travel sector destroy value. What they found was that as a share of all investment in the industry, airlines and airports make up at least 80% of the investment, but both subsectors earn negative returns on invested capital against their weighted average cost of capital, meaning they are destroying value. However, in the transport industry, travel agents account for a tiny amount of the overall investment into the industry, which makes sense given that a small of capital can be used to build a shop front or website to take bookings. However, travel agents earn high returns on invested capital given their super light capital structure and upside potential. Let's take another look at airlines. And here I want you to think of Qantas, Virgin, etc. While the industry will ebb and flow and some investors will make money from time to time owning these stocks and investing in these types of assets, for the most part, this is where capital goes to die. Here's a summary of airlines. Number one, they're capital intensive, requiring huge amounts of investment in planes, property, plant, equipment, and maintenance. This is why many of them turn to leasing planes and or debt, which is supplied by investment banks. Airlines must pay airports to land and take off on runways, meaning they're price takers. They take whatever price is thrown at them. In case you don't know, this is why premium airlines always get preferential treatment over flight times, and if weather conditions turn bad, you'll often find Qantas or Virgin over a discounted airline is able to land at an airport. Next, airlines compete against competitors that are often state-backed. Many countries around the world financially support their airlines because they see them as a strategic asset that is in the country's interest, meaning for-profit airlines are competing against competitors that may have financiers with unlimited pools of capital. Next, airlines are heavily regulated in more ways than one. Safety comes first. We've all seen so many documentaries or movies that we now know what the FAA stands for, even if we don't work in the industry. Pilots are highly trained, well-paid, and often part of unions. 
Next, weather events and black swans also hit hard. When a company has low returns on capital, it has less wiggle room. I once spoke to an airline analyst whose job it was to calculate which flights and routes were profitable for his airline. He told me that if a plane sits on the runway for 15 minutes longer than expected, the flight is unprofitable. Then there are black swan events like COVID, extreme bad weather, geopolitical concerns and so on. Finally, airlines operate in a competitively priced market. Consumers have full transparency when it comes to choosing which airline to fly with. Do I fly Qantas for 2500 or Etihad for 2500 to London? Maybe you'll fly Qantas because it has a kangaroo. But how about if Etihad is $250 cheaper? If you study the financials long enough, you will likely find that airline loyalty programs are some of the most profitable parts of these businesses because it's their attempt to build an intangible asset that allows for some pricing power. Naturally, I could go on about the many ways airlines struggle to create value. Yet, as you probably know if you've followed him long enough, the industry still exists and even great investors like Warren Buffett tend to get suckered into investing in them from time to time. Richard Branson, who is the founder of Virgin, says the easiest way to become a millionaire is to start as a billionaire and launch an airline. One last thing on airlines and the transport industry. You need only learn about Australian entrepreneurs like Graham Screw Turner, who's the founder of Flight Centre Travel, to know that some parts of even the worst industries can produce excellent returns for investors. The idea is that you should be picky and remind yourself to look in the places where value is created and avoid price takers in industries with chronic oversupply. How to stress test a moat. Porter's Five Forces is one of the most powerful tools that portfolio managers and analysts should use to understand the opportunity for a business. What's especially surprising to me is that many Australian analysts and investors have never even heard of Porter's Five Forces, let alone used it in their analysis. Overseas, in places such as the USA, Europe, or even South Africa, Porter's Five Forces is a much more popular tool used to stress test a company's competitive advantage. I covered this concept extensively in the Value Investor Program 1.0, the first iteration of our Value Investor Program on RASC Education. In short, the true test of a moat is its ability to increase prices and retain slash grow the customer base. This proves to you that the company has a sticky product and pricing power. But how do you determine if a company may have pricing power in the future? How do you identify if a company has the potential to create a wide mode of its own in time? This is where Porter's Five Forces comes in. Porter's Five Forces can be used to prompt you to identify where a moat may be weak or strong after considering all of the usual forces that can impact a company's business. Porter's Five Forces encourages you to think from five different perspectives. From the supplier's perspective, how easy is it for a supplier to drive up prices for the company you're researching? How many suppliers are there for each key input? Is the product unique? What is the switching cost? Then we might consider the company's advantage from the buyer's perspective. Can buyers drive down prices? How many buyers are there or is there customer concentration? Can a buyer of my company's product switch easily? What's the competitive landscape like? That's our third point. How many competitors are there and what is their cap capability? Are the products equally attractive from those competitors? And what's stopping one of my buyers from changing to a competitor? Number four, the threat of substitution. Can customers go to other places? Can a different product be introduced to disrupt my company? Why are these particular products so important? Can they be substituted? If it's a software company you're looking at, what's the lifetime value to CAC ratio or customer acquisition cost? And finally, under Porter's Five Forces, let's talk about the threat of new entry. Which companies could enter this market? What's the minimum efficient scale they would have to reach? And how long would it take? Are there any economies of scale in this industry? And are there any regulatory or legal considerations? As you can see, it's important to think of a company's competitive advantage from five perspectives. So quiz yourself to understand where the balance of power may lie. For example, if you were studying a purely cloud-based accounting system like Xero in 2014, at the time, there were heaps of competitors such as MYOB, Reckon, and QuickBooks. 
but none of them offered cloud-based accounting because they were stuck on desktop computers with CDs and dozens of different versions, making them unstable for accountants, hard to update and difficult to use on the road. Accountants just hated the software. For Xero, there were many competitors, but their capabilities weren't as strong as many expected. Xero also had a unique product and knew that once accountants uploaded all of their clients' accounts, they were unlikely to switch back. Xero also didn't have to rely on any suppliers for parts like a manufacturer or even for distribution like CDs or retailers like JB Hi-Fi because it was all cloud-based. A newer cloud-based product was eventually introduced by QuickBooks, but it was still obvious that the first few products were inferior to Xero. And as Xero grew in popularity and started throwing conferences, which they call XeroCon, to celebrate accountants, it quickly harnessed a strong network effect and benefited from massive economies of scale, being that more accountants equals more users, more users equals more accountants, which equals more developers building inside the Xero app store, which equals a stickier product. And so here we can see how Porter's Five Forces, which looks at the five different perspectives of analyzing and um, assessing a competitive strategy or moat, could have helped you look deeper into Xero to discover a remarkable company. Here's a funny story. I worked in an office of accountants who refused to migrate to the cloud until COVID hit and they couldn't work from home anymore. They also told me things like, Xero is an amazing company, but I'd never own the stock because it's not profitable. They couldn't see past the profit and loss to see that what Xero was building was an incredible network that would, one day, blast past its inflection point and into profitability. When moats go exponential. Finally, I want to thread this discussion of moats into management and execution. In the book Guerrilla Game, Investing in High Technology, there are some tremendous threads on identifying what they call guerrilla companies the companies that dominate industries. Basically, if a company such as Xero and the industry such as cloud-based software is ripe for the picking, a good management team can significantly increase the value that's captured by executing well. For example, by launching new products or services that meet an increasing demand. We saw this with Microsoft Windows going on to launch Microsoft Office and Internet Explorer And when this happens, when we see companies dominating an industry, setting standards because they are so popular, and the industry itself growing as they extend that advantage, what we see from a competitive advantage or moat perspective is three things. Number one, higher returns to shareholders are more likely because the company keeps on dominating a more important industry. Number two, the period in which the company can win keeps increasing. So it's extending its competitive advantage period. And number three, the risk of the company actually decreases. Now you might be thinking, okay, a company that dominates and keeps winning, aren't we supposed to think that that makes the company more risky? After all, buy low, sell high, right? Number three catches investors off guard. What do you mean the company gets less risky as it grows? You see, we're often taught that cheap stocks are safe and good, and that the bigger a company gets, the more risky it becomes. It's gone up 200%, they say. It can't go any further. Gravity has to kick into overdrive, right? Not always correct. You may remember from previous discussions that I've had on the podcast that less than 5% of companies or stocks create all of the wealth from the stock market. This was found by Bessenbinder. Let's use an example to illustrate this extension of a competitive advantage by a management team. Xero was a much riskier business when it had just 10,000 subscribers in New Zealand, when Rod Drury started the business. But now that it has over 3 million subscribers around the world, it is a far less risky business because the company is a gorilla in accounting software. So what do you think? Is Xero more risky now? than it was in the past, even though the share price has gone way up? Or is it less risky? Ultimately, while it's difficult to identify these gorillas before they happen, they do exist. The point is that if you can find a competitively advantaged business in a growing industry with 
great management who can extend the competitive advantage period in some way, special things can happen. That's why a discussion of moats and competitive advantages was important for this 10-part series, the Investor Bootcamp on the Australian Investors Podcast. In summary, we've talked about what a moat is, why companies can grow excessively if they have a strong and durable competitive advantage, Morningstar's five types of advantages being network effects, intangible assets, cost advantage, switching costs, and efficient scale, why some industries have more companies with wider moats like healthcare, consumer defensive, etc., and other industries like real estate or even materials have many companies that don't have those wide moats. Finally, we talked about the airline industry and how that destroys value, then how to stress test a moat using a tool like Porter's Five Forces. And I also referenced some other books and how you can go about learning about these types of businesses. There are some fantastic books out there, some fantastic resources. You'll find some in the show notes for this episode if you click the link in your podcast player and go to the Investor Bootcamp Trading Manual, which is my Google Doc. From there, you'll be able to download it or you can just keep it there and you can reference it at your will. Remember that we have a few other episodes to go in the Investor Bootcamp mini series. So if you haven't already, please hit subscribe and uh, give us a review on the Australian Investors Podcast if you like this. Or if you want to get in contact with me, you can find me at Owen Rask on Twitter. If you want to share some examples of companies with wide moats or companies with very strong competitive advantages or how you think about them, I would love to know what you have to say. So please reach out to me. We've got a few more episodes to go on the Investor Bootcamp mini series. If you want to extend your knowledge and learn more, you can head to Rask Education, where you will find our Value Investor program. This discussion today was a direct extract of that program. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast. We'll be back with more expert interviews in coming weeks once we put a bow on the Investor Bootcamp mini series. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast.